Are you tired of hearing nothing but bad news? Tune into the good news of the gospel. Greg Fritz has been changing lives through the good news of the gospel for over 35 years. This good news will inspire, inform, and change you so you can live daily in all the promises of God. Welcome to Good News with Greg Fritz. Hello, this is Greg Fritz. Welcome to the Good News program. We are talking to you in these sessions about living life with no regrets. And that is not just the title of a teaching series. This is a way of life. You can completely remove regret and feelings of sadness and sorrow, mourning, resentment, bitterness from your life if you choose. You can't control what people do to you, but you can control the way you react to it. And nobody has to be filled with resentment and regret because we have the gospel, the promises of God, the Spirit of God to help us through any challenges in life. In fact, when you get God involved, you can come through the challenges of life better than when you got in, went into them. You can become better and better. You can go from glory to glory, from faith to faith. In fact, the Bible says it's the faith that's tried by fire that's more precious than gold. So a lot of things that happen in life that we consider problems or challenges or inconveniences are actually opportunities to refine our faith, to showcase our trust in God and to do exploits for Him and to please God in the midst of trials and tribulation. Now, God doesn't send those things, but we can overcome and we're supposed to overcome. You know, and that's the, the scriptures talk about how the greater is he that's in us and we're overcomers and we walk in victory and the victory's ours through Jesus. And we, we love to, to, to preach those scriptures and hear those scriptures. And then we act like when we have a problem that, that it, you know, life is over, that it's a horrible thing. If you're an overcomer, you, you're going to face some things to overcome. <laughs> if you have mountain moving faith, don't be surprised if you face a mountain. To, to move and to stand against. If you have giant killing faith, don't run away and hide when the giant shows up. Use these things that we learn and that we've re been revealed to us by the Spirit. We can use them in, in real everyday life and they make a difference. They ought to make a difference every day for us as we live uh, in the, the reality of the, the Word of God and the Scriptures. We ought to be happy. As I've said, we ought to be the happiest people in the world. One of the things that robs happiness, one of the things that causes regret in our life is bitterness. And we're talking about bitterness may not be the, the most appealing subject you've ever heard. But I'll tell you what, if you're dealing with a root of bitterness, this will help you get over it. And it'll also help you avoid having this problem in the future. Uh, we've taken our scripture, Hebrews 12, 14 and 15 for this teaching. This is our theme verse, but let me read it to you. It says, Pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord, looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. Bitterness causes trouble. Man, we don't need more trouble. The dictionary definition of bitterness is anger and disappointment at being treated unfairly. Well, this, uh, this really does include just about all of us. You've been treated unfairly, I'm sure. These things happen in life. Uh, things don't always go our way. There are many injustices in the world, and we can't control all of those things, but we can control the way we respond to them. We don't have to respond or get overwhelmed with a spirit of disappointment and bitterness and anger and resentment. We don't have to go that route. Your life is a gift. And we were talking about bitterness in the big picture, and this is the big picture. It would be better that you were born into a fallen world with all of its faults and failures than not to be born at all. And because of Adam's sin, there was only one choice, either wipe out the human race completely, do away with this project, or allow people to be born into a fallen world. Because of this, people are born into some very unfair circumstances and situations that they didn't ask for. I can't change that. But what I can do is give you the truth of God's Word so that you can make the most of your life, so that you can give God what you have. All of us only have one life to give. 
And, and God knows how limited or how restricted you are. When we get over to heaven in a hundred years, a thousand years, do you know it won't matter whether you were a prince or a pauper. It won't matter whether you were a genius or you never even learned to read. What will matter is did you give what you had to God? Did you honor God with the life that you lived? Did you make the most of this opportunity, this gift of life that you've been given? And all of us can do that. That, in, in a sense, makes life fair. I said this, and I'm going to say it again. You may be watching this from a prison cell. You may be doing life without parole. You may live the rest of your life in the penal system or in a solitary confinement cell, but you can still give that life to God. You can give the time that you have left, your being, your body, your thoughts, your words. You can give that to God and say, Lord, I don't have much to give, but I'm going to give you what I have. And folks, 100% is 100%. There are people that are doing great things in the world and everybody recognizes them. They're heroes, they're legends, they're famous, but they haven't even given 1% of their life to God. And that's really failing to do what you were born to do. And in the end, it's not going to be worth anything. There are other people who, may, they go to church on holidays, on a religious holiday, and they think they're giving God service, they're tipping God, they're giving Him 1% or 2% of their life. The rest of it they reserve for themselves. That's not successful in the eyes of God. Don't let bitterness cause you to quit. Don't let bitterness and resentment over unfairness and injustice cause you to give up and to not try anymore. You have a life. You can give it to God and nobody can stop that. I don't care if you were an orphan and your family abandoned you. I don't care if you were born in poverty and, you were, and, you, and you've never been educated in your life, you can still give your life to God, and it's just as valuable as somebody who's had everything that you haven't. We all have equal access to God. What I'm saying is there's no reason to get bitter. I mean, there are plenty of opportunities to become bitter, but there's no real reason for anybody to get bitter because that leads you nowhere. It, lead, it doesn't lead you to success or fruitfulness. And when you have the opportunity in life to serve God and to love God and to bear fruit for God, why not take that road? Let me read this to you. It's in Romans, um, Romans chapter 8, verse 18. Paul said, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Man, that's a great way to look at life, isn't it? And Paul suffered, and if we have time, we're going to get into some of the sufferings of Paul. I mean, he, he really faced a lot of injustice, and he considered it a badge of honor. When he's telling you all the things that happened, he's talking about it with, with pride. <laughs> they beat me with rods. They stoned me. They, I've been shipwrecked. You know, some people have a flat tire and they think God's forsaken them and something terribly wrong in the universe and terribly unfair because my tire went flat. Paul had three shipwrecks. That's devastating. He spent a day and a night in the deep. Wouldn't you feel abandoned? Think about that. 24 hours floating in the ocean, wondering if you're going to get eaten by a shark. If anybody's going to, this is before there was a Coast Guard. He could have been left out there to die. He floated out there after having a shipwreck because he was doing the will of God. He was on a mission from God and the ship sank. He ended up floating on a board for 24 hours and finally, it doesn't say how he got rescued, but he didn't say, you know what, it's going to take me a long time to get over this. It's just not fair what life's done to me. All I'm trying to do is help people. He didn't go down that road. He said, I'm so proud. I got to, I got to go on a shipwreck. I got to float in the deep and, and believe God for 24 hours, not knowing what was going to happen in my life. You, you can take any situation and turn it into a stepping stone. Or you could take the smallest infractions in life and allow a root of bitterness to come in and defile your thinking. You know, people have used this to give up. They've, they have used it to become angry. They've used it really to, to get into a life of crime. 
They've said, you know what? It's not fair what's happened to me. I haven't had an even start. I haven't had a fair deal. Everybody else has it better than me, and I'm going to make it. I'm going to make it up. I'm going to do. I'm going to. I'm just going to give up on trying to do things right and do things the right way. That's no way to live life. There's no future in that. I know it's tempting. When you're done wrong, the, the, the temptation is to rebel and to get even and to, and to you know, to try to feel some, some, some sort of satisfaction through revenge, but there's no future in that. That is an option and some people choose it, but it's not the best way and it's not God's way. They're literally allowing bitterness to consume their lives. I don't want my life to be consumed with bitterness no matter what happens to me. We've got to move on. Listen to this. There is no such thing as a wasted life. I don't care how you came into this world. Being born is better than not being born. Existing is better than never existing. And so we should look at life as a gift, a gift from God, and you get one, and you can do anything you want with it. Nobody can take that away. No matter how bad the circumstances into which you were born were, nobody can take away the right that you have to use your life for whatever you want. And maybe you haven't used it wisely. God's the God of the second chance. It's never too late to get on board and to let God make up the difference. And that's the power of this teaching on living with no regrets. I don't care if you've done everything wrong up to now. You can make it right today. You can get with God's program and He can make up for the, diff make up for the things you lost. He can replace the things that you missed. He can undo the things that the world did to you. And you can have something to be proud of, something to look back on and to rejoice over. It's all up to you. I love this verse, and I hesitate to read it sometimes because of our social, you know, surroundings nowadays. Everything's changing so fast. Sometimes you don't even know what you can say and what you can't say. But if you take this in the right spirit, Colossians chapter 3, verse 22, it says, bond servants, and I'm just going to tell you, he's talking to slaves, people who were owned by other people. And that is not a pleasant thought. And I hate slavery, and I'm glad it's been abolished, and I think it should be done away with, and it should never happen. And there are a lot of things in life that aren't fair, and slavery is one of them. It's one of the worst. It's one on the, of the highest on the list. A slave has no rights. He, he's limited to whatever the master says, and it's a terrible thing. But here's the, the, the situation. There have been people, slavery's been in existence for thousands of years. And there were people who were born and died in slavery. And, and to me, this verse is a powerful reminder that there's no such thing as a wasted life. You may think poverty is, is, is slavery or, or, you know, illiteracy is slavery or not having an education or being born, you know, in a, in a very uh, disadvantaged situation is slavery. But there was literal slavery. And if there, if there was such a thing as a wasted life, you would think it would be a slave who had no rights, who could make no decisions except what the master allowed. But God had a word even for these people because he doesn't overlook anybody. He's reaching out and saying, look, if you're a slave, your life's not wasted. He didn't say, if you're in slavery and you're owned by another person, you can't really do much for me. So when you get free, if you can get free, get back with me and I'll give you a plan. But until then, I really don't have much for you. That is not at all God's attitude. His attitude was this. If you're a bondservant, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in sincerity of heart, fearing God. And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. Oh, that's powerful. Say, well, what's God doing? Is he condoning slavery? No, I believe Christianity was the beginning of the end of slavery. And thank God it's almost gone now. But realizing that some people were going to live that way, God said, even you who are bound, and you could translate this into your situation. As I said, you could be in a jail cell. You could be uh, poverty stricken. You could be trapped in, in a 
country that's, that's just ravaged by war and famine and pestilence. You may be a slave to your surroundings, but you can live your life for God. He said to those slaves, what you do, do it for me. You can't choose what you get to do. You have to do what you're told, but you can do it for me. You can change your motive. You can do what you do and make it a supernatural offering. You can take your one life that somebody else literally owns, but you can give it to me and I'll take it and I'll use it and I'll reward you. There will be slaves, people who lived and died in slavery in heaven that will be greatly rewarded for what they did on this earth and they never lived a day of freedom in their life. There'll be other people who had all the advantages of modern life and that made great strides financially, socially, and they won't even be recognized in that day because they didn't give any of their life to God, not 1%. Man, this kind of levels the playing field if you think about it. The only fair place in the world to go is the kingdom of God where all are equal in Christ. There's no bond or free. There's no male or female. There's no Greek. There's no Jew. There's no poor or rich. There's no educated or uneducated. We're all one in Christ. That takes away all your disadvantages, gives you an opportunity to rise to the top no matter what your circumstances may be. I just want to encourage you, leave bitterness behind. Quit resenting the way you were born or where you were born or the, or the parents you had or the surroundings, your neighborhood that you grew up in. It may have been horrible, but that's no way to get ahead. Take what you have right now and give it to God. Your life counts. It doesn't matter necessarily what you do in life, but what matters is how you do it. Who are you doing it for? Who has your allegiance? Who do you relate to? Who do you look to to please? You have the gift of life. Praise God, that's something to be thankful for. You may never leave your village wherever you were born. You may never leave your state, your nation. You may never go outside of your town, but you can live a successful life for God and you don't have to be bitter. You don't have to envy the people who can travel and get away and get around. You don't have to envy the people that have more than you. You could take what you have, give it to God and say, one of these days we're gonna be in heaven and everything's gonna be made right, and I'm gonna be happy forever and ever and ever, and it'll make this life look like the snap of a finger, and all the things that I wrung, wrung my hands over, and all the things that I was so obsessed with in this life will be gone, and they won't have any, any effect on that life. It's not all right now, it's not all fair, but it will be. It'll be better than you could ever imagine. It's worth waiting for. It's worth living for. It's worth dying for. It's worth refusing to become bitter and angry and resentful. That simply wastes your life on things that really don't transcend this life. Look at Ephesians chapter 6. Once again, he's talking to slaves, and this could be whatever you situation you find yourself. We're all limited. Nobody's free to just do anything and everything that they desire. Everybody has limitations. Some have more than others. But he says this in Ephesians 6, 7, with goodwill doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive the same from the Lord, whether he is a slave or free. Isn't that good? He says in Colossians 3.17, Whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. And really, I mean, what this, this is the opposite. This is the opposite of bitterness. It's, it's, just, it's the opposite reaction to life than bitter. Bitterness says, it's not fair. Look what they did. Look what I had to work with. I'm just, I'm not going to try anymore. I'm just going to hate and I'm going to resent and I'm going to regret and I'm going to wish it weren't so. And, and, and it gives people an excuse. Listen, there's plenty of excuses to quit. There are plenty of excuses not to try anymore, but, but life's too valuable to do that. And, and bitterness is, is taking that, that, that road, that lesser road and saying, it's just not worth it. Well, it is worth it. So what is it? What, what good is it? There's plenty of good. 
There's plenty to be gained by living your life for God, by not allowing. But I've said this over and over in these teachings, but it's true. Sometimes the greatest thing you can do in your life is just be happy. <laughs> refuse to be sad. Be, refuse to be depressed. Be happy. Look, look, at, look at what Paul said. I, I've got to get to this. In, in Acts chapter 16, Paul and Silas, uh, they went to Philippi to preach the gospel. And um, it, in Acts 16, 21, we'll go there. Because it's not fair what happened to Paul and Silas. And, 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 and they couldn't stop it. I mean, they were just trying to do the will of God. But they responded to it in a way that, that they refused to allow bitterness and sadness, resentment, despair, and hatred. They refused to allow that to come in. Notice what it says in Acts chapter 16, verse 21, or verse 22. Then the multitude rose up together against them. They were preaching, and the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. Not a pleasant experience. Verse 23. And when they'd laid many stripes on them, they threw them into the prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. Now, Paul and Silas were Roman citizens. I'm not sure about Silas, but Paul was a Roman citizen, and it was illegal for them to be beaten without a trial. And so what was done to them was not only unfair, it was not only painful, it was illegal. Man, it would be easy to get upset and call the lawyer and say, I am going to sue you. I'm going to take you to court and I'm going to take everything. Oh, you're going to be sorry you did this to me and get into this, this fit of rage and revenge and anger. But that's not the way they approach this situation. Verse 24, having received such a charge, the jailer put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. So after they were beaten, they weren't put in the hospital and their wounds weren't attended to. They were put in the dungeon and their feet were put in stocks. What a terrible position. Now, sometimes we read these things and, you know, we romanticize the, the, these Bible days as if, as if angels were singing and there's just such an atmosphere of glory. They were in the dungeon. This is not a modern day prison with cable television and air conditioning. It's a dungeon and their feet are in stocks. The most uncomfortable position to be in. It would have been so easy to get angry. It would have been so easy to say, you know what, God, we've we've tried to serve you and look at the thanks we get. Man, we're just trying to preach and help people and they have attacked us. They've beaten us. If I ever get out of here, I'm going, I'm, going to, I'm going somewhere else where nobody knows me and I'm not going to make any more trouble. I'm not going to try to help another person. I'm not going to try to preach to anybody else. There's just not worth it. They didn't say that at all. As I said, Paul took these, these abuses as badges of honor. He was proud to suffer for Jesus. I, we just don't even think that way anymore. But I tell you what, it's hard to get bitter when you look at life that way. So instead of becoming bitter and angry, verse 25, at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God and the prisoners were listening to them. Man, oh man. You know, that's the last thing you want to do at a time like that. It's not like they probably felt this overwhelming desire to sing. Their backs are hurting. Their feet are hurting. They can't get comfortable. They can't go to sleep. The whole town's mad at them. They don't know their, their future. They don't know what's going to happen to them the next day. And yet, they sang and praised God. What a reaction to a horrible situation. You know, God can't use some people because they, they can't handle opposition. They fold at the slightest bit of challenge and confrontation. And so God can't put them in a volatile situation where His glory can be seen because they can't stand the pressure before the glory comes. Uh, it's so easy to just give in to bitterness and anger and revenge. We can't allow ourselves to go down that road because there's too much opportunity if you know how to react properly to the challenges of life. They sang praises to God, and you know the story. Suddenly there was a great earthquake. The foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were open, and everyone's chains were loosed. The keeper of the prison, awaking from sleep, seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, he drew his sword and was going to kill himself. And Paul then took over. 
It's amazing. He's in the dungeon, in the lowest place in the prison, and all of a sudden he takes over the prison and he takes charge. He said to the jailer, don't do yourself any harm. We're all here. And the jailer said, yes, sir. And he told all the prisoners, your doors may be open, but you stay where you are. And they said, yes, sir. And then the jailer took Paul out, took him home and, and said, what can I do to be saved? And Paul got him saved. He took him home. He fed him. He, he washed his back. He got him all back together. Then the city fathers came and apologized. And Paul said, you come tell us yourself. And they were humble. I mean, everything turned around drastically, dramatically. But it's simply because Paul and Silas refused to give in to bitterness and resentment and anger and despair. He said, this may be a bad situation, but God is still God. His, his word's still true. He's still on the throne. And we're going to rejoice in the things we know. We don't know a lot here. I don't know why I was born in this situation. I don't know why I didn't have the talents or gifts as other, other people had. I don't know why I didn't get the good job. I don't know why I was born in a country with no opportunity. I don't know all that, but what I do know is God's a good God. I do know that there's a future in Him. I do know that His Word is true. I do know that He's worthy to be praised. I do know that He's forgiven me of my sins. Begin to rejoice over what you do know. In James, he says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials and tribulations. Count it all joy. That's, that's the last thing you want to do, but that's the first thing you ought to do. And as you do that, you say goodbye to bitterness, to despair, to regret, to anger, to revenge. All of those things are negative and they don't get you where you need to go. Wow, well, I hope you got something out of this. Hope you're encouraged today with the life of Paul. And I, and I pray that bitterness will become something you recognize and reject immediately so that you don't spend years of your life going down the wrong road. <laughs> Life's too, too, too valuable to do that. Take what you have, give it to God. Praise the Lord. Well, we've run out of time again today. I look forward to continuing this teaching on our next session. Until then, may God's best be yours. No matter what you've been through, God has made it possible for you to be free from your past and excited about your future. In this series, you'll learn how to apply God's Word to your past so you can experience joy unspeakable and full of glory. To order your copy of this series, visit our website, gregfritz.org. If you've been getting a lot out of this teaching on forgiveness in this particular portion of our teaching in the Living With No Regrets series, this is the section. It's in our scripture cards. It's called Past Sins. And I give you several scriptures plus a confession that you can apply to your own life in your own prayer time and begin to destroy the effects of guilt and shame in your life. Go to the website, request your free copy of these Living With No Regrets scripture cards today. In this series, you'll learn how to apply God's Word to your past so you can experience joy unspeakable and full of glory. To order your copy of this series, visit our website, gregfritz.org. Coming up next on Good News with Greg Fritz. The more like Jesus you are, probably the worse you're going to be treated. But Jesus was, was never sinned. He never did anything wrong, much less hurt anyone. He never did anything wrong. And they crucified him, beat him and crucified him mercilessly. Well, this kind of is part of the process. We are going to be treated unfairly in this world, and you have to know how to respond to it, or you'll be an emotional basket case. You'll need therapy. You'll need help. You'll, you'll, you won't be able to recover uh, the, from the scars of life if you don't get the scriptures in you and become proactive in some of these things. 